welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nangia. In this two-part series today, we are going to take up a very, very interesting topic. This is the emerging role of the General Council since the liberalization era. See, the past 30 years, how the role of the General Council has changed greatly and why it has grown so much in stature and as well as importance in the corporate world. And I wouldn't do the talking. I have one of the best panelists that one can have on this topic. May I introduce you, uh, Mr. Bharat Vasani, famously known as the former group general counsel of the Tata group of companies. As we all know, it's one of India's, but not only India's, but one of the world's largest industrial groups. But that doesn't stop there. He is now the corporate partner at Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. And there is a small little anecdote about him that he was also part of the expert committee that rewrote the company law in India. Welcome, Mr. Vasani. You are, uh, I see you on Legally Speaking for the first time and look forward to some very interesting inputs from you. Thank you, Tarun, for your kind introduction. Uh, may I introduce you another key cog in the General Council Wheel of India, Dr. Sanjeev Gemavat needs no introduction. He's a founder member of the General Council Association of India, and he's the executive director and the group general counsel for the Dalmia Bharat Group, as, which we, as we all know, is one of the biggest uh, industrial groups in India. Uh, good to see you again, Dr. Gemavat, and looking forward to your frank views, as always. Uh, you've been very frank and forthright in the earlier episodes, and I expect you to be the same as you are in today's episode. Uh, may I also welcome uh, Mr. Ryan Karanjawala. He's managing partner of Karanjawala & Company, which, as we all know, is one of India's leading litigation law firms. Uh, welcome, Mr. Karanjawala, and good to see you again. And let us begin uh, from uh, laying the ground of the show, following which we'll start our opening comments. May I request, Mr. Karanjawala, that you founded the firm sometime, I think, in the very early 80s. And you would have had the experience of dealing with general counsels for well over 40 years now. You would know because you would have visited the offices of these corporates, met them, engaged with them at, uh, at a level uh, from the early 80s. Could you share with us how have you seen this office change in 40 years? And then I would like to start the opening comments in about two, two and a half minutes, if you could share your experience with us. So, Tarun, if I were to describe the role of a general counsel, there are, of course, many functions that a general counsel does. But if I were to sum it up, I would say that he is the legal conscience of the company, is also the legal compass. I remember very clearly what my friend Behram Vakil, who's a partner, senior partner in AZB, once told me. He said, Ryan, remember one thing in America. He said, the general counsel of GE sat on the board with Jack Welch. If Jack Welch wanted to do something and the general counsel said no, it wouldn't happen. That, in real terms, should be the power of the general counsel. On matters legal, he can veto the chairman. Because ultimately, the responsibility of steering and shepherding the company to the safe shore, as far as legal matters go, is that of the general counsel. And I, and I have always felt, this has been my personal view, that the one area of law in which the Indian corporates have not kept up sufficiently is that of their in-house legal team, the amount of money, the amount of resources that they spend on their in-house legal team is far too little. They'll, they'll crib, but they'll spend crores of rupees on counsel. They'll crib, but they'll spend lakhs of rupees on solicitors. But to their own internal team, they will always be scrounging around. When in fact, it should be... I remember I had a long conversation where during that Arsenal takeover with Aditya Mittal on this. And we had a long back and forth, and ultimately, I think he sort of agreed with me. I said, because, you see, it is the general counsel who ultimately steers you to a safe harbor. And the one group, historically over the years, which has had paid a lot of attention to that, and is different from other firms, has been the Tata Group. Bharat Vasani is, of course, an eminent person, but the legal team of Tata's, many years ago, had two people. S.R. Baki, who was a leading partner of Mullah Mullah, left Mullah Mullah, joined the Tata Group, and he was one of the leading solicitors of his time. And the other person who was 
always their legal person to go to a Nani Palke wala, who sat on the board of Tata Sons. So you see, the Tatas have from the beginning somehow appreciated the role that a general counsel plays in the field of the running of the company. I don't see similarly enough attention being given by the other groups. And frankly, it should be because a lot of the companies which are in trouble today, a lot of the CEOs and promoters which are in trouble today wouldn't have been in trouble if they had had top class general counsel and chosen to listen to them. That's so I really feel that the role of the general counsel in India is still not sufficiently understood or sufficiently appreciated. That's a very well point that, you know, if you would have listened to your general counsels by taking decisions, a lot of promoters would not be in the problem they had today. That's a very important point you shared. I'll go to Mr. Bharat Vasani. Now, you uh, sat as a group general counsel, the top boss of the legal department in one of the world's largest industrial corporations, the Tata Group. Could you share with us how in the past three decades you see you saw this role evolving and then we can move ahead? See, yeah, in fact, uh, you know, I will continue on where, where Ryan ended. And in fact, I want to tell you how the role has evolved. I started my career in the early 80s and the word general counsel was not known in India. The heads of legal departments were described very dis differently and some of the company secretaries also kind of discharged the role of a compliance officer and general counsel or legal head. They primarily dealt with coordinated the litigation work with solicitors and you know real estate work and sometimes some commercial contracts drafting. The entire piece of transactional work, MA transactional work, which is rise and rise of corporate law firms like Amachans and AZBs and Khaitan so come, that all happened in 2000. We had an earlier very inward-looking economy with all very draconian, stringent laws for license quota, permitrage, MRTP Act, and IDR Act, and licensing and import-export controls. So when this was all dismantled and LPG policy, I would say, which it started in 1990s and early 2000s, liberalization, privatization, and globalization, which was started in the backdrop of economic compulsions of uh, July 2091, uh, July 1991, the issue is that now what has happened is that the GC... I was perhaps the first person designated as his GC because before Tata Group, I was working for an American corporation uh, called Dow Chemical USA. And when I was selected in Tata's to head the legal function, I requested that my title be the group general counsel. And I remember the then finance director, Mr. Ishat Hussain, asked me, Bharat, but this title is very unknown in India. I said, that's why Tata should make the beginning. And we were the first one thereafter. Birlas chose one as a general counsel and thereafter the practice. But Tata's were pioneer for the first time when they designated me as a group GC in December of 2000. Uh, my relationship with Ryan goes since then. The issue which is there is that Ryan has very rightly pointed out the GC's team today is grossly understaffed in most corporations and uh, for a variety of reasons. And the role has expanded so much because, see, our entire legal architecture has become very, very complex. Well, there's a policy to simplify the ease of doing business in India and a lot of pronouncement. The regulators, I think, are still left of the center. So if you see the way SEBI changes its regulations almost every week, the way RBI changes the FEMA regulations almost every week, the way Ministry of Corporate Affairs changes the company sector regulations almost every week, so the entire regulatory architecture has become extremely complex. And with this arrival of foreign direct investment and private equity investment and foreign institutional investors, a huge amount of work, which we never did in the 80s when I was in Philips India and other companies shell, suddenly became a very big transactional work, which is these buying and selling companies and in making investments and entering into joint ventures and collaborations. This all started, if you see the rise and rise of India's corporate law firm, there's a very interesting book by Harvard Law School. Uh, and that book basically describes how this profession has really grown only in the last 20 years. And uh, all these big law firms of today, whether it's Cyril Merchant or other firms, they are all have really, earlier it was all this Mullah and Mullah and Crawford Bailey and small size firms with, you know, about 10, 12 partners and each one doing their own work and not much of. Now the firms of this size with 800 lawyers, 900 lawyers became the reality. And the role of GC also became very important because he was required to manage this very important piece of work which was never done in the past, which was the m &A transactions. And this led to increasing the role, but there is no corresponding increase in the size of the team. 
and one very big lacuna in the indian legal architecture is that while company secretary is defined in the companies act company secretaries act the word general counsel does not come in any of the laws it is not defined he doesn't have any clear role so the role differs from corporations to corporations as ryan said that if group like startups give very important role to gc is the culture of in the majority of the corporate governance system but there are corporations where promoter driven where even gc today is also not that well regarded and he has a very minuscule role in the top management decision making and he does not have a seat on the board large number of gcs in india today do not have a seat on the board like in us you know when i went to dow chemical to meet my global boss general counsel's office is next to the ceo's office in india it is never the case cfo and manufacturing and marketing and other guys are there in us you will see the first office next to the ceo is a general counsel because do you know the lab if indian laws if the enforcement of contract in india was very efficient and fast like in us and other mature jurisdictions and i tell you the gc's role also would have become much more important today the corporations are not, not as much worried about the liability issues whether product liability whether any other like torches liability because it takes donkey's years for india to litigate and arrive at any conclusion so i genuinely believe that if at some stage india's legal system become far more efficient in terms of delivery of justice faster this is role will become equally important like what is it in the west today today i would say 95% of the general counsels of various indian corporations do not sit on the board they are partners of law firm who come as independent directors and sit on the board you know but the gcs are never on the board they may be invited for specific discussion at the board meeting as an invitee but they are not part of the board but what one point central point which ryan made is i genuinely believe that most of the gc teams are grossly understaffed and as a result they in, end up outsourcing a large chunk of work to various corporate law firms is also a large chunk of money goes to the councils for arguing the matters of course you need councils to argue the matters because as per our advocates act gc cannot appear in a court but central point which i wanted to make was that this function deserves far more focus and attention than it currently it is there it is there for large mncs which are operating in india or pro- totally professionally managed company but where it's a very strong promoter culture i still find that gc have a relatively lighter role in terms of decision making process or getting a adequate attention of the top management team that's my view thank you for that opening comment uh, and very enlightening one at that uh, i will go to dr sanjeev gema but sir you speak for the whole industry not just for your company uh, because as a founding member of the general council association you are the voice of hundreds and thousands of general councils and if you could give me an opening comment from that perspective from for the whole industry how you have seen the role evolving uh, first uh, tarun thank you very much for inviting me to share my views on very very important topic and it is it is very close to my heart i agree with mr karanjawala and bharat the way in which they express their views and i have a few comments on those issues as well but then before that let me say that yes general councils role importance and relevance has increased many fold this there is no doubt about it and in the last three decades but the way in which i see this relevance and importance is uh, it's a absolutely natural progression of this evolution of the gc's role you know it was a similar kind of role or similar kind of evolution which happened in the american justice delivery system or american corporate legal system corporate legal ecosystem if i can say so so what this corporate a uh, uh, legal ecosystem is it comprises of two parts one is certain macro factors which is basically which you know comes from the state or the or the market uh, and the third part is of course the bar members and all then the second part is the micro level of factors and which is basically the law firms like mr karanjawala's firm and many other firms which got evolved and got created in the last three decades uh, the second part element of that important part is the client which is we as corporate clients and the third part is the legal education now the interplay of these factors that determines the legal ecosystem as far as general counsel's role is concerned now i will give you a perspective as far as this legal ecosystem is concerned in a, in a slightly more detailed manner but then since i just said that it's a natural progression for the simple reason that this 
ecosystem determines that what kind of legal services would be there. And it is exactly the same system, which is called Krevet system in the United States. That Krevet system is that you will have a law firms, a full service law firms with a, with a quality, um, you know, a people from a good law schools. And then you have those compensation structure for those um, uh, firms. Now, the, that Krevet system's natural progression, the next level in American jurisdiction, jurisdiction was also the role and importance of general counsel, as Mr. Karanjavala pointed out, that G's member is sitting on the board. That's a natural progression which evolved there also in the United States. And the similar kind of model is getting developed here in India also in the times to come. I will... I am again saying that I will focus on this aspect more because that is uh, that is relevant as far as the future part is concerned. But then I want to, on an opening comment part, I want to make a one important comment. What uh, you know, just to take uh, what Bharat has expressed. Tarun, this is the only profession. This is the only profession in India which controls corporate India. All that compliances, ethics, litigations, documentation, the corporate India. Corporate India is being managed by this, this breed of professionals. Can you believe that, that this profession is not regulated anywhere? It's not regulated. Tarun, I'm a chartered accountant professionally. I am not a practicing chartered accountant, but I am still a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. And similarly, I am a member of various other institutes. I might not be practicing, but then I am still a member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India or the Cost Accountants of India or the Chartered Secretaries and Administrators and so on. But the moment I join my profession as in-house counsel or general counsel, Advocates Act and the Bar Council regulations, they don't acknowledge me. They don't recognize me as a professional. So, so it means what? A profession which is governing the whole corporate world that is not regulated today. And since that is not regulated, how that importance would come, perhaps that is one major correction which needs to be done. And I would be needing your support, uh, Mr. Karanjawala's support and, and other participants also of the legal ecosystem that, that this needs to be corrected. Because in the fourth industrial revolution, the kind of progress which we are doing from the economic growth standpoint, I think this is one major correction which we need to do. So just an opening comment on this, but then I can take it this forward as well. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. In the coming episode, we will take this issue of regulation. Uh, I'll go to Mr. Karanjawala. Uh, you heard to what uh, to what Mr. Bharat Basani and Master Sanjeev Kemar had to say. Any comments on that, and then we can move ahead. You know, both of them made very penetrating points. I especially liked Bharat's insight into the American General Council, and the insight he gave was from a physical point of view. He said that the General Council's office is next to the Chairman's office. That shows his importance in the whole sphere, and the point that. Dr. Sanjeev made was even more crucial that you are having such an important office which is completely unregulated. In fact, you know, maybe over the years they should evolve a certain sort of the bar should work towards or the law colleges should work towards a sort of a training. So people, you know, because today what is happening is in our profession. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands and lakhs and lakhs of people want to do law. But they're all a little confused. You know, then some will go for a job here, some try their luck there, and so on and so forth. Maybe there should be a special course of specialization also in what the role of the general counsel is, because he has to have a broad-based idea of the law and yet be able to zero in on a situation if required. And Dr. Sanjeev absolutely rightly pointed out that, you know, you need to regulate it, you need to empower it, because if you want the legal system to become that of a first world country and similar to that of a first world country, then you certainly have to have a situation where from the beginning, you catch this and you deal with it. And Tarun, your topic is very topical, actually, the topic that, on which we are speaking. Because, you know, college principals, law colleges, they must also say, okay, look, let's have an optional course on just what are the things that a general counsel has to specially look out for so that people who want to be general counsel yes. arm themselves with that course so that ultimately when they join a firm or join a corporation, 
they're slightly better prepared to deal with the situation. And I think one of the things which Bharat missed out on when he was talking about uh, the amendment to the company that maybe just as you have to have a certain amount of independent directors on the board of the this thing, the general counsel should be obligatory. You know, he must be a member of the board so that people understand his role. Obviously, then, if once you're a member of the board, you can't just hire anybody. You have to hire somebody with the status commensurate to the status of your independent director. So, naturally, you get the best quality. And then the general counsel's responsibilities are there. He has to be, he will be the man who will be first held liable if something goes wrong. Because then he can't say, but I didn't know, nobody consulted me. So, you know, going forward in legislation, in education, there is a lot of scope. I mean, this is just offhand thinking, hearing two eminent people on the panel. But there is a lot of scope for further developing this whole concept. You know, one, move towards it being compulsory for any company of a certain size and above to have a general counsel on the board. Yes. So that's that's one thing you have. That automatically then changes things. You know, everything, everything revs up. Let the education ministry, let the law faculties apply their minds and see. And you know, you can go to Harvard. There must be there must be so many courses in Harvard and elsewhere, which can be borrowed from, incorporated into the Indian ethos and brought forward. So there is a lot of scope for taking up the suggestions of my two co-panelists and developing on them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, with this, uh, we would uh, bring uh, part one of our discussion on the emerging role of general counsel to a close. On part two, we will discuss, most importantly, the issue of regulation that Dr. Sajid Gemavat brought about. And what Mr. Karanjawala said that above a certain size should there be some mandates uh, about, you know, what kind of, what larger legal department, what kind of importance should he be on the board? Can all this be regulated, put under or codified, put under a law so that things happen that way? But that's for part two. Uh, at the end of part one, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Vasani, uh, Mr. Ryan Karanjawala, Dr. Sajeev Gemavat for sparing time and joining us. And thank you viewers for joining in. Thank you very much. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.